Hey guys, Chris from Propel here, and today we're going to be talking about belt drives, more specifically Gates belt drives. It's, I have a good amount of experience with that, and we're seeing them become more and more popular in the market. Now, we did a video with Gates last year at Eurobike, and I kind of really enjoyed diving a little bit deeper into this technology to a lot of people is kind of a mystery, like how this thing works and why it's good. I figure it'd be cool to make just another video, diving a little bit deeper, showing more of the technology, talking a bit more about the history. You know, one of the things mentioned in that video was that Gates was founded in 1911, and I thought that was kind of interesting. The way the story goes, as far as I understand it, is this entrepreneur basically moved out to Colorado, bought this like tire company, but was really just like involved in rubber. His brother came on board and later they started getting involved in belts. This is really what they were most known for, specifically a V-belt and specifically reinforced belts. They really exploded based on that technology. I guess historically people were using leather belts even for automotive applications and that sort of thing, but they started getting into rubber and then reinforcing that rubber with these different strands. They're a pretty large company, I think over a billion dollars. They produce belts for all different applications and they seem to really be like the experts in the field. But getting back into like what belts are and why they're important to the bike industry specifically, I mean that's what I'm focused in. And, even more specifically electric bikes. The belts have really been just growing in popularity. I think that's for a variety of different reasons. I mean, belts just make a lot of sense. They're cleaner, so you don't have to lube them. They don't really attract dirt as a greasy chain might. Don't get me wrong. I mean, chains still have their proper application and they still make a lot of sense for a lot of applications. But belts, I think, are really growing in popularity, particularly in certain categories like commuters or long distance riders, people that are touring cross country, etc. You might be wondering like why even reinvent the wheel if you will. You know, chains seem to work pretty well, but actually chains there's a lot of downsides to them. I mean, they require more frequent maintenance, so you're gonna often need to grease the chain, you're gonna need to replace the chain. I mean, some commuters I see riding in less ideal conditions, they can need to replace a chain as low as a thousand miles or so, whereas we've seen belts last well over 10,000 miles. I mean, we've even seen, actually there's another video on belts uh, made by Cycling About, and he was talking about how on average, he gets 30,000 kilometers out of a belt. That's pretty significant. I mean, I'm not always the greatest at doing this math, but I think that's somewhere around like 19,000 miles. That's a, a pretty big distance. I, I don't think you'll ever see a chain go that far. The belt drives just make sense for a variety of different reasons, and I guess that's really why they've been growing in popularity, particularly uh, with electric bikes, which is what we generally sell. You know, I think people just don't really want to worry about like greasing their chain every so often or replacing it more often. And I think that that's overall just a trend. I mean, what I think about is we're really trying to market our car replacement. And if you really want something to be like a true car replacement, you shouldn't have to get it serviced like every thousand miles. That kind of seems like a lot. I mean, I guess in theory there are certain elements of a bicycle that might need service even less than a thousand miles. Like for example, tires, you're going to need to inflate them a little bit more frequently. But if you can avoid certain uh, maintenance elements, it's going to be kind of beneficial and, and really from my side, just give you that peace of mind and just that like worry-free experience. And I think that that's what I prefer. Some people are taking their bike, they're leaving the garage, and just when they want to take it out, they want to worry about like getting it ready. You know, maybe just throw some air in the tires and, and go. I should mention that belts are usually paired with what's called the internal hub. So I guess we can talk a little bit more about like the technology of the belts specifically and the way they work and the way that they're actually uh, implemented on the bike. So you have the belt and I guess if we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the technology of that belt specifically, 
you know, most people look at the belt and they say, well, it's just like a piece of rubber, right? But actually it's not. It's a lot deeper than that and, and the technology is a lot more advanced than that. I mean, you got to think that this thing is uh, capable of withstanding quite a bit of force, uh, really just as much as a metal chain is. And so if that's the case, just a simple piece of rubber is just not going to cut it. I think that there might have been historically some uh, manufacturers that have just used rubber on its own, but Gates, they say it's Gates carbon drive. The idea is actually that there's carbon strands inside the belt and it's a continuous carbon strand. And then that's covered with a polymer. It's, uh, it's kind of a plastic type material. Uh, but it is flexible still, so uh, I guess it's a, you know, just a very specific composite. And then there's a nylon material on the bottom side of the belt teeth. So the belt teeth are rounded, then there's a nylon material. That material goes in between the belt and the cog. Uh, the cog is what actually drives the belt. You have one in the rear and one in the front. And the idea is that that nylon material is intended to protect the belt uh, from wear and abrasion. Because really, that's ultimately, over time, what happens is the metal of those cogs will actually wear down. And it's kind of interesting, actually, that the belt in general is not the part to wear down first. It's usually the cog. So it's actually, the belt is actually wearing down this metal cog and over time it becomes sharp and that's at what point you have to actually replace ideally the belt and the cog. So these are cogs. This is a front cog. This, this is specifically the center track design. This is the design which is used uh, specifically for e-bikes. It's a primary application. I mean, there are other belts which are used on bikes as well but the center track is really the most advanced technology and the one that we'll generally find on the e-bike specifically but or premium bikes i should say so it's center track because it has these teeth and then there's actually a a track that goes right down the center there and then this is the belt now you may notice that it's kind of in this just like rolled up form here and uh, it's not folded or anything like that. I just wanted to note real quick that there's a couple of details you wanna be mindful of when handling the belt specifically. Because there's carbon strands in there and because the way the material is made up, you don't wanna fold it, you don't wanna stretch the belt over a cog. You shouldn't put the belt inside out. You should also not try to pry it onto a cog that could damage the belt. So this is the belt in its open form. You can put one cog here and you could put one cog here and th so that's basically the front cog and the rear cog and so as it turns that's that's the deal but if you you feel the material it's yeah it is kind it does feel a bit more like plastic than rubber and then you can kind of see the that uh, nylon material which is almost like a fabric which is coated again by that like plastic polyurethane material on the outer side. Now Gates does make the cogs as well as the belts because they're engineered very specifically to work together. And there are some companies that make aftermarket ones, but I think that they actually don't work as well, which might seem like a minor thing. But one thing I have noticed with belts is that it's a very precise technology, I guess you could say. Uh, the belt line needs to be very dialed in. The frame uh, manufacturers, the bicycle manufacturers that are actually using belts, they have to take special precautions in the way that they create and build their frames. They need to be particularly stiff. If they have any sort of flex to them, they might not have as much tolerance for any sort of variance in the frame. So say if you're pedaling really hard and the rear of the frame flexes a little bit, the belt doesn't really like that too much. So, you know, generally you want to make sure it's a really good quality frame. And usually the frames are specifically designed to accommodate belts. And sure, there might be ways to integrate a belt on a frame that wasn't designed for it, but it's usually not recommended because it wasn't designed for it. I mean, you know, it's, it's not designed to uh, 
keep those same tolerances and that sort of thing. In order to have a belt drive on a bike, you need a couple of different things. One is you need effectively a single chain line or belt line, if you will, probably more apt for this particular application. The idea is that there's no split in the belt. Uh, it won't fit in between the different uh, cogs of a normal cassette and chain, so it needs to be just straight there, just like that, you know. So in order to do so, you can't have the normal gears on the outside, so basically that means that you'd have to have the gears on the inside or just have no gears at all. But in the electric bike industry specifically, I think we see it more often paired with what's called an internally geared hub. And as the name describes, the gears are inside the hub. Uh, there's a variety of different types of internal hubs. And actually this type of hub started a really long time ago. Originally there was like two and three speed hubs, then we went to five speed hubs and eight speed hubs. Now we go up to 14 speed hubs with the roll off specifically, which is really gaining in popularity. And then there's also some hubs that don't specifically have gears. It's one of the most popular ones and the one that's probably most popular in our shop specifically is the Enviolo hub or previously more widely known as Nuvinci. And that's a continually variable transmission. The idea is that there's no steps to it. Instead, it just changes the gear ratio by changing these planets orbiting the orb in the, or a ball in the center of the hub. And that's how the ratio will change. So you kind of have something like, instead of one through eight or nine, you effectively have like one, 1.1, 1.2. And it's kind of more like a volume dial than like a channel clicker as those of you that are familiar with that type of thing. I know some younger people might not be so familiar with it, but basically, you know, a normal gear switcher, just you click into the individual gears, but the Enviolo, it shifts more continuously, more smoothly. The challenge is though, I think historically, these internal hubs have not been all that popular in the States specifically, but they've been very popular in Europe. And I think the idea is that these internal hubs are really designed largely to be low maintenance, just really easy to use, easy to adjust, really clean. So for commuting applications, for this more like utility type of cycling, it makes a lot of sense. But historically, the US hasn't really been so focused on that type of cycling. I mean, it's been more sport. And even to this day, it seems to be this like, people are stuck in this mindset that a bike is really just made for uh, sport. It's really made to go racing or, you know, or maybe just for recreation, where most other places in the world, a bike is widely recognized as a form of transportation. It makes a lot of sense, especially in urban environments. And internal hubs make a lot of sense on those types of bikes because they're very low maintenance, they're very clean. And then when you add a belt to it, it really just increases all of those benefits of being clean and low maintenance and that sort of thing. So as we're seeing cycling for transportation grow in the US and really across the world, we're starting to see this sort of application grow as well. And belts really pair well with that. I mean, one of the applications actually is bike share, kind of a mix of electric and non-electric bike share. But I think that bike share in particular, the bikes that you know, you'll just find, New York City is the largest example of bike share with the city bike, the blue bikes that you see just all over the city and you can just grab them and ride for a couple miles or however long you need to or want to. And then you have those same types of bikes really throughout cities, throughout the country or maybe some other uh, corporate campuses or, or college campuses, et cetera. But if you think about it, they, they really need those to be very low maintenance. Those things take a lot of abuse and generally they're gonna have an internal hub and now actually we're starting to see some with belts as well. But let's check out the belts on the bike and we can dive in a little bit deeper. So this particular bike has kind of a unique design to accommodate the belt. 
it has what's called a upper chainstay. So normally this here is a chainstay, this is a seat stay, this is the seat tube, and this creates that rear triangle. Normally your chain or belt will kind of go through this portion because it will come through here and then basically go around the front uh, chain ring there. But to alleviate the issue of the belt going through this rear triangle, instead, basically, they just raise this chainstay up. This is kind of a challenging design, and I think that it might add to some pressure that's put onto this portion, hence the need for this really beefy tube here. But I don't want to get too deep into that, but I just want to give you an idea that, you know, it takes some kind of special engineering, and it's not the easiest thing to just put a belt on a bike. So that is one of the challenges of implementing a belt into the design of a frame. Now, a lot of times people say, oh, I want that bike, but I want it with a belt. But, you know, it's just not that easy, unfortunately. But many manufacturers are starting to get better and better at that, and some are better than others. Uh, this particular brand, Risa Mueller, they do a really great job, and they have belt drives available on pretty much all of their bikes. And I think that they're, you know, some ways a trendsetter in the space, in that there's more and more companies that are actually following their lead. But uh, it's not uh, really about Risa Mueller today. We're just talking about Gates and talking about the belt specifically. But there's many other manufacturers, and probably most of the manufacturers that we offer in the shop actually offer belts because we're largely focused on commuter type bikes, on cargo bikes, on bikes that are really intended to be car replacements. And I think it makes a lot of sense to have a belt on there. But We'll dive a little bit deeper into the belt and the design here, and you could get a little bit of sense of some of the details, like this snubber here, which is intended to keep the belt there and, and that sort of thing. But I wanted just to give you a little bit of a better picture of this design on here and how that works exactly. So this particular drivetrain on this bike, they have the Bosch Generation 4 speed motor with the Enviolo rear hub paired with the belt drive here. And this is a pretty popular application, uh, specifically a center drive motor with a internally geared hub in the rear. I mean, particularly for a belt drive, it just makes a lot of sense. There are some applications in Europe that we don't really see here very much, which are hub motor bikes with a belt drive. Um, with that, if you wanted to have gears, generally you're gonna pair that with a gearbox up front, which is pretty, uncommon here in the States, the Enviolo hub or the Roloff hub tend to be the most popular, but there's also options available from Shimano. They have the Alfine hub, which is available in the eight and 11 speed gear range, as well as a new five speed system, which is made specifically for e-bikes. And as I mentioned before, probably a little bit less common is the single speed gear setup, which you just have no gears in the back. Um, that could make sense for some really lightweight, uh, simple applications, but it might not perform as well on hills. So to talk a little bit more about the actual makeup of a drivetrain with a belt, you're gonna have a couple different components. One, uh, you have the belt, then you have the rear cog, which is generally smaller than the front cog. Uh, as with most e-bikes, this is the center track design, meaning it has this little slice down the center. And this allows for the belt to stay perfectly aligned on the cogs. And it also helps to displace any debris that you might end up getting on the belt, because as the belt goes around, it actually will push any debris through the cog, which is, uh, specific patented design that they have where it's not continuous there's actually openings there to allow for uh, any sort of you know mud or sand or whatever just drop out there they had a pretty cool uh, display at Eurobike showing the belt going through like muddy water and you could just see everything kind of dropping out and it coming out relatively clean on the other side so I kind of appreciate the, the design there and how that works. This is when things get particularly a bit more unique than what you might find on a traditional bicycle with a derailleur and cassette. There's a couple different elements. One, we have this dropout slider. This is a dropout and the idea is that the axle can 
drop out of this hole here. So we have a solid axle here, which is uh, what the Enviolo comes with. Although it is available in a through axle version and then the roll off will generally find either a quick release or pot potentially a through axle as well. But, but this is the dropout and normally this might just be fixed for, to the frame because a normal derailleur, the derailleur actually provides tension to the chain. But in this instance, we need to have this sliding dropout in order to provide tension on the belt. Because without that, we wouldn't really have the flexibility to adjust that. But the idea is that you would loosen these two screws here and then you would tighten this set screw or loosen it. Uh, now if you loosen the screw, it's going to pull the dropout back. If you tighten it, it's going to push it forward. And that's how you're going to align the belt. Now you have this same setup on the other side of the bike as well. And you would use that and you need to make sure that this is perfectly straight. Now there are some tools to align this. Sometimes we might use a caliper to measure the distance here and we can compare them on both sides and make sure they're exactly straight. Once this is set, then you can tighten these bolts and you can ensure that the belt is aligned properly. But it's not just about aligning, which is very important, I should note, but it's also about the tension. There's a variety of tensions that are recommended for belt drive bikes and Gates actually has uh, some recommended variables. They, they measure the tension in two different ways. One is Hertz and it's basically just based on you like kind of strumming the belt and it, there's a certain frequency that the belt will emit, I guess you can say. Based on that frequency, you can determine how tight the belt is and whether or not it's inside the parameters that they recommend. And the Hertz generally correspond to a pound rating and it's basically like how many pounds it takes to really fully tension the belt, uh, as in like if you well, usually you'll do it from the top here and it's how many pounds until it actually will like stop moving effectively. So there's a couple different tools that you can use to measure the tension. There's one is a app that can be downloaded for an iPhone, iOS or uh, for Android system. And that basically will just measure the sound and it'll measure that uh, frequency in Hertz and it will tell you with, with whether or not you're within the recommended parameters there. The other tools, which are more of a manual setup, one is called the Cricut tool. Basically, it goes on your finger, you push down on it, and then it basically senses when it stops allowing you to push it down. But there are some other larger tools which are usually used in the assembly process and you know the same basic principle which they're testing the the pound that's usually what we use in the shop but occasionally we do use the app and that's certainly something you can use at home because it's a it's a free app to download it's pretty basic and that's kind of one of the maintenance elements i should mention that's just about like keeping the belt taut i will say that over time the belt doesn't really stretch out all that much i guess over time it could wear down in some ways and i guess that's kind of in some ways similar to what a chain does over time it'll wear down and in theory because it's wearing down it might need to be taut a little bit more so you'll have to adjust the dropout pull it back a little bit now that we went over some of the you know more specific technical details of the belt I wanted to talk a bit more about, you know, some of the questions that come up a lot when people ask about belts specifically. You know, a lot of times people ask, like, how does it handle different terrain? And I think that that's a pretty common one. Uh, and actually it handles it really well. I think better than a chain, really, for the most part. I mean, that includes sand. Actually, we did some riding and testing in the sand recently, and we were just throwing sand on it and blowing it away and stuff like that. And it actually, because there's no grease, it doesn't really stick on there so much, which is really nice. Uh, and I think in a similar fashion, like snow and rain and that sort of thing is a big deal. Well, actually riding a bike with a chain in the rain produces a really uh, undesired uh, result where it's just dirty and greasy and getting all over the place. So, um, and, and if you don't have enough lube on your chain, then generally you end up with 
a rusty chain as a result, but that's not really a concern here. So a normal belt that you didn't have this like center track design, you might be more concerned about uh, dirt because it can get caught in here, but actually because you have these pocket openings, it really allows for the dirt to escape and probably even more so than a chain uh, or even like in muddy conditions as well. Uh, which is pretty cool. Temperature is really not an issue. It was actually researching that a bit more just to be super clear on the information that you're putting out there. And I think it goes upwards of like 190 degrees it can operate up to that temperature. I mean, keep in mind, they're also using these in like industrial applications and that's actually, you know, automotive and industrial applications is really their background. And, you know, under those conditions, you got to think that things get pretty hot. Uh, a belt inside of a motor bay, that gets pretty hot, probably can get upwards of 190 degrees. That was actually one of the cool things I saw when I was researching this, like, you know, checking out the different applications and seeing like the different uh, ways that they use this. I mean, uh, motorcycles, is one of the popular ones. Uh, Zero motorcycles, electric motorcycle brand, they use them. There's another really large motorcycle brand that uses them as well, which is Harley Davidson. You also see it in pretty much like every automotive application. So like if you ever needed like a timing belt, a serpentine belt, you know, an alternator belt, all that sort of stuff, if you want like the best, it's generally going to be Gates. That's just like the bottom line. That's how it goes there. I mean, they really have the longest history in it. And, you know, that's just how they do it. Actually, one of the things I saw when I was researching it is they were like, they use this belt to pick up like a forklift or a, some sort of machine like that. And I was really surprised to see that, but I think it gives you an idea that it's not just like a rubber belt, that there's actually some serious strength behind that thing. So another question that comes up a lot is like what brands or bikes are available with belts, because maybe it's not always so easy to find them specifically. I mean, we have a lot of lists of bikes on our website that are available with belts. Uh, we happen to really seek them out actually, but uh, Gates does have a list on their website, but just some notable ones that we found. I mean, Risa Muir probably, you know, they have the most models available out of most brands, specifically in the U.S., I'd say. More and more brands are being introduced there. Turn is another brand that's starting to do more and more bikes with belt drives. Initially, they introduced their HSD with the belt drive, and recently they just updated their GSD to include a belt drive as well. And that bike's going to be available later this year, so they'll have that available with the NVOLO as well as the Roloff Hub. Their HSD, they have it available with one of those Shimano hubs. It's the Shimano Nexus 8-speed. And then they also have another version that has the NVOLO and the automatic shifting. That bike's actually pretty popular, and it's kind of a unique one at that in that it's like fully automatic. So you really have this like really low maintenance, very simple to use uh, sort of setup. And, and I think we're starting to see that application come up a bit more. Another brand that we work with that does that also is uh, Butchers and Bicycles. This is a three-wheel trike that has a belt drive and has the standard NVOLO, which uses the manual shifter. You have the option to go with the automatic version. They also have a chain and derailleur version, but I would say it's probably about like less than 5% people actually request that specific version. I mean, most people given the option, they're gonna go with the belt. I think it makes a lot of sense, especially in these sort of applications. Some other brands, uh, Gazelle is also starting to introduce some bikes with a belt drive. I think they've had some in Europe, but now they're starting to come over here. Urban Arrow, they have uh, an option to upgrade their bike to add a belt onto it, which is kind of cool. So the standard is a chain drive version, but you can swap the cogs and add the belt there. In Europe, Trek has a model or they have uh, their like sister brand, Diamant. Uh, I don't know how you say that. I'm sure somebody's going to correct me in the comments, but uh, <laughs> that's just how it goes sometimes. It's pretty wide, uh, the range of bikes, but I think that what I'm seeing is uh, what started as a little bit of more of a niche product. It's really growing. And I know niche, yeah, I know that one too, it's okay. What started out as kind of a niche product has really grown in, in popularity. And I think it will continue to grow as the commuter market grows, as the e-bike market grows, as people 
kind of start thinking of these bikes as more as a utility and not necessarily just as a recreational bike. I mean, not to say that people that are using for recreation doesn't make sense to have a belt. I mean, I think that that's a growing population of people as well. I mean, there's a lot of people that might put their bike inside an RV. Would you rather have a nice clean belt inside your RV or a, a chain that's got, you know, grease on it? Not that I want to like diss on chains. I mean, you know, as I said, there's plenty of applications that make a lot of sense for chains, but I think that these are the sort of things that people are thinking about, right? I talked on this before, but a lot of times, what well, can I add a belt to a bike that doesn't have one? I think it's important to clarify that, yeah, it's really not an easy thing to do unless the bike was specifically designed to be able to accommodate a belt. So I think that's an important thing to consider and to remember there. More specifically, if you don't have this like upper chainstay design, then you're generally gonna need to have a break in the frame. And sure, maybe it might be possible to add that in there, but you gotta think that that frame might not be specifically designed to handle the torsional force in order to keep that belt specifically straight. And as I mentioned, a chain could potentially accommodate that slight variance if the frame was to flex a little bit, but uh, a belt really uh, needs to stay very straight in order to work effectively. Well, what are some of the other questions that people come up with? One is the efficiency. People talk quite a bit about the efficiency. And the reality is the efficiency is not all that much different and a worn belt is actually more efficient than a worn chain. So starting out, a chain is slightly more efficient than a belt, but over time, actually a belt is more efficient than a chain. But I think what becomes more of a factor probably is the different drivetrain. A chain and cassette is really, or more specifically, a single speed drivetrain is probably one of the more efficient drivetrains out there. Then you go to a chain and cassette and then as you go to internally geared hubs, you can tend to lose a little bit of efficiency. The roll-off happens to be one of the most efficient internally geared hubs, but you have some other hubs which lose efficiency a little bit. The Shimano is in a similar efficiency level as the roll-off hub, but the Enviolo hub is one of the less efficient versions because of that continually variable transmission. It kind of works more on friction rather than like a traditional gear system, and because of that you lose a little bit in the transmission. You do improve efficiency slightly over time, so that's something to be mindful, but you know, despite all this, it still happens to be one of the more popular drivetrains specifically for electric bikes, or at least in our shop. Because, you know, you think about it, once you have electric assist, does that slight loss in efficiency really matter? For many people, they value the ease of use and lower maintenance over the efficiency. I mean, the reality is we're not talking about racing here, right? I mean, some people are. I mean, I like to go fast, but I still think I value having that lower maintenance, easier to use system. So it happens to be one of the preferred drivetrains for me personally as well. The one of the detail I think comes up a lot is like, can you have a full suspension bike with a belt? And historically the answer has been no to that, but actually a couple of years ago, Risa Mueller introduced a full suspension bike with a belt. And it was kind of revolutionary because there was no real simple way to handle this because as the bike suspension compresses, generally you might have a slight variance on the tension on the chain historically, or you know, in this case, a belt. So how do you handle that? They actually found some way to put a pulley like right here, and it was just at the right pivot point. Like if it moved one inch this way or one inch this way, it might actually not work so well. And now they have a little bit of a different system. It's like a pulley, but it's kind of a little bit more like a tensioner and it seems to work really well. So, you know, they've been running with that more and more and they've introduced that to many different models. And well, I think some manufacturers are starting to copy a similar design, but it's really not very easy to pull off, but I got to respect them for, for doing that. I guess that's really mostly what I wanted to cover on the belts. I'm sure there might be something that I missed and you guys can ask in the comments if you have any additional questions and I'm sure either myself or somebody that might even have some more technical experience might be able to chime in. Overall, you know, you might have gathered I'm a pretty big fan and uh, there's a lot of bikes that we offer with this and 
And I think we'll continue to do that. I mean, really, we've just been leaning into it. I think this is the future. If you have any questions, maybe you have experience yourself with having a belt drive bike, you'd like to chime in, maybe let us know how many miles you got on it or kilometers if you're in another part of the world. Yeah, I look forward to seeing you guys in a future video. I'll put some links down below to some additional resources and that sort of thing. If you want to learn more about gates and learn about belts, etc. cetera. Um, there's another video that I referenced, uh, this guy from Cycling About. I think that's a good video to check out. And uh, I look forward to seeing you guys in the future. All right, well, see you soon.